I invite you to turn back to the book of Ephesians. We've been going through Ephesians throughout this first month of 2022. And you covered verses 1 to 14. And what I thought I would do today is continue on that, that trajectory. And we're going to look at this prayer that the Apostle Paul prays in the second half of Ephesians chapter 1. And we're actually going to focus all of our intention upon verse 17. But I'm going to read uh, the whole thing for us for the context. But I'd invite you to stand now with me out of reverence for God's holy word. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, says this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and of power and dominion. And above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the wonderful word of God. You may be seated. So as I just mentioned, at the beginning of this new year, 2022, you have been studying the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And you have seen how God has blessed us as Christians with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's what verse 3 had said. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours. Blessings of the past. Blessings of the present and blessings of the future. For our blessedness goes all the way back to eternity past. When God in his good pleasure and wisdom chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. The only reason any of us ever chose God is because he first chose and elected us to come to Christ. No one can come to me, said Jesus, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. So that's the, the blessing that goes back to eternity past. But our blessedness also fills us with joy at the present time. To know that we have been adopted as sons and daughters of God, redeemed by the blood of his beloved Son. So that we can praise and glorify his name right now in this moment today and so our blessedness is not just in the past and it's not just in the present but but the apostle paul invites us in ephesians chapter one to also look to our blessedness in the future for the holy spirit is our deposit and our guarantee until we get to take possession of the inheritance that has been promised us and what an inheritance that is it is the kingdom of heaven the celestial city, the heavenly Jerusalem. But even better than that, there's no sin there. There's no death. There's no grief or sorrow or pain there. But even better than that, it's where we get to gaze upon the face of the Lord Jesus in the presence of God the Father himself. That's what our future inheritance is. That's why we can be blessed and filled with joy in this present moment as we look to the past and we enjoy the present and we look to the future together. That's our inheritance, that's our salvation, that is our goal, that is our joy. And that's just up to verse 14. That's what we've seen so far in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. And today... I'd like us to, to finish off the chapter in a certain way by looking at this prayer now. This prayer that the Apostle Paul prays for the Ephesian 
believers. He is so filled up with joy and passion and the wonder of every spiritual blessing give, given to us in Christ that now he bubbles forth in prayer. And it's as though he's saying, in light of all of those spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, what then should we be seeking? What should we be looking for in this life? When we look to the past and we enjoy the present, we look to the future inheritance that will be ours, what should we be doing in the meantime? And I want us to focus in especially on the one key phrase that he uses here. And that's the theme that we're actually going to be developing over the next few weeks as we come further into this new year of 2020. Because if you think about it, there's, there's a whole long list of things that the apostle could have prayed for, right? He could have prayed for good health. Oh, I want you Ephesians believers to stay healthy. Or he could have prayed for church growth. Oh, I want the, the boundaries of your church in uh, Ephesus to just grow so wide so that everybody hears of your church and you've got a thousand people or whatever. He could have prayed for that, couldn't he? Could have prayed for safety or, or protection for the people. For more money or funds for the ministry. He could have prayed for that. Or, or more influence in the culture of their day. The Apostle Paul could have prayed for any of these things and, and for a whole host of other things, couldn't he? But today, this morning, I wanted to, to sink in for us this morning what for Paul is at the very top of that list. What's number one? What does Paul desire more than anything else for these Christians? Because if it's at the very top of Paul's list, it ought to be number one for us as well. And if this prayer is not the cry of our hearts this morning, then I want to impress upon all of us this morning that our priorities are wrong. Let's begin with verse 15. Look with me there. It says this, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. We're going to pause there for a moment. We see here that Paul is acknowledging that he's speaking to Christians here. He has heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus. He knows of their love for the saints. But in his prayer, he's going to challenge these Christians to a higher level. To press on towards something. And so the first question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, do we have faith in the Lord Jesus and love toward all the saints? Is Paul not only talking to the people in Ephesus, but is he talking to us today? Do we meet this basic level, this basic requirement? Let's make sure that at the very least we have faith in Jesus and love toward the saints. For this is the foundation of what Paul is about to pray for. If this foundation has not been laid down first, the foundation of faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all the saints who adore him, then what Paul prays for in verse 17 is going to be meaningless and useless to us. So he's talking to Christians here. But he continues in verse 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So here we see that the Apostle Paul is truly thankful for these believers. He says that he never stops giving thanks to God for them. He's always remembering them in his prayers. And in verse 17, we are about to see what Paul's prayer for them is. This is the prayer that tops the list of all his other prayers that he might have. This is what the Apostle Paul desires most for these believers. This is how he wants them to grow. This is how he wants them to thrive and flourish. And let's remember that it's not just the Apostle Paul who desires this. Let us always remember that it is the Holy Spirit of the living God who is speaking through Paul. So it is the Holy Spirit who has inspired the Apostle to write these words down. So, so what we're going to talk about today, this is actually the desire of the Holy Spirit for believers. And if that's the case, then this is something that we ourselves ought to be praying for continually and desiring and longing for with all of our hearts as well. 
And so what is this prayer that is above every prayer? What is this desire above every other desire? I'm trying to build the suspense here. So you're at the edge of your seat. What is it? What is it, Pastor? Well, I'll tell you right now. Let's look at verse 17. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. This is the prayer. And the key word here is the word knowledge. That is the core of this prayer that, that Paul is praying here. What does the Holy Spirit, three, speaking through the apostle, desire most for believers? That we would know God. That we would have knowledge of God. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning together talking about this. The knowledge of God. What it is to know God. Because this is the essence of the Christian life. And so it's worth the mental sweat to try to understand it. If you don't take anything else away from this sermon today, then remember this. I must know God. With every breath of my lungs with every beat of my heart, with every, with every longing sigh of my soul, with tears streaming down my face and with my knees knocking together and my hands trembling, I must know God. And this morning we're going to zero in on this verse with three questions today. First of all, what does it mean to know someone? What does it mean to know someone? Secondly, who is the one to be known? And thirdly, how is God known? What does it mean to know someone? Who is this one that we must know? And how is he known? So let's begin this morning by considering this question in a general sense. What does it mean when we say that we know someone? Well, right from the beginning, I think we have to make a distinction between two levels of knowing, right? Because we use this word or this phrase to know in two ways. The first way is very general. It's very you know, shallow. We say, do you know so and so? Oh yes, I know him. No, I don't know her. Now does that really mean that we know that particular individual well or in a deep sense? No, it doesn't. It means that we've met them and we know maybe a little bit about him or her or we know of them, or we've heard of them. Usually if we just have one pleasant conversation with a person, then we claim to know him or her from that moment on. But do we really know that person? Hardly. Or on the other hand, if we have a bad experience with someone, we may think we know them in a negative sense, right? And so we avoid them, or, or we warn others about them, because we think we know them, or at least we, we know them well enough to know their character. So yes, we may claim to know our mailman and our hairdresser, and it may be true that we know their names and a little bit about them, but can we say that we really know them well? In most cases, we can't. This is that very basic and shallow way of knowing another person. But you know, it's sad to say that this is how many of us know God. We know him about as well as we know our postman, or a co-worker, or the neighbor across the fence. We are happy to say that, yes, we know God. But do we really know him well, in a deep and intimate knowledge? So for most of us, or at least many of us, God is more of an acquaintance than a friend, and not even really very close to being a best friend. Let's do a little exercise together, shall we? I ask you to bring to mind your best friend. Bring them to your mind. Could be your, your spouse or another best friend, the person who knows you best and you know them. Now maybe this person has since passed away. That's okay. You can bring that person still to mind. They were your best friend. Or maybe you're thinking, I have so many best friends that I can't choose. Well, don't panic. It's okay. Just bring to mind a, a good friend, a close friend that you know well. Or maybe the opposite. You're thinking, I don't have a best friend. 
don't, don't panic. Don't panic about that either. Just bring to mind someone that you can say you know well. Okay, do you have that person in your mind? Now I want you to rate how well you know that person on a scale from one to ten. One is you don't know them very well. Ten is you really, really know them well. Just assign a number in your head. You can be honest. We're not going to share these things with one another. Now most numbers, depending on how close a friend you're thinking of, will probably be a six or a seven or an eight or even a nine. I don't think we'd give a ten because we recognize that we can't know another person perfectly. Okay, so you have that number in your head. Okay, that's good. Now I ask you to bring to mind God. Not an image of God in your head, no. But bring your relationship with God to mind. How well do you know God? Now be honest and rate how well you know God on a scale from 1 to 10. Now this may have gotten to be a little bit of an uncomfortable exercise. But let's follow it through together. Because now I ask you to compare those two numbers. With how well you know your closest friend and how well you know God, your Father and Creator and Savior. And I want us to reflect a little bit on the difference between the two numbers. Because you can protest right now, Pastor, it's like comparing apples and oranges. I, I can see and touch and hug my friend. I can laugh with them and cry with them and experience life together with them. I can't really do any of those things with God, can I? And that's a fair point. But God has given us the precious treasure of his self-revelation through his word so that we can know his heart, his will, his character, and his mind. And he's also given every believer in Jesus his own Holy Spirit to know him in a living and vibrant way. And he has promised to incline his ears to us when we cry out to him in prayer in the name of Jesus. And so God has provided us with everything we need to cultivate a deep relationship with him. But the question is this, do we have a desire to know God deeply? Because it comes out of a desire, first and foremost. Because this is the other way of knowing. This is that second way, where it's not a shallow or surface level knowledge, but it's a knowledge that goes deeper. In English, we, we usually have to use or add the word well, don't we? As in, do you know this person well? Or we put a special emphasis on the word know. Do you know that person? And when we talk about knowing God, this is that second kind of knowledge that we're after. Do you desire to be merely acquainted with God or to really know Him deeply? It is my prayer that as a church, each and every one of us will begin to hunger and thirst after a deeper knowledge of God. It will actually become a pressing burden on our hearts to, to press on and to really know Him to know him by his word, to know him in prayer, to know him by his spirit, to know him in a daily walk. This is what the Apostle Paul is praying for in the hearts of believers above everything else. We should be unhappy, discontented, and dissatisfied until we are knowing God more and more, becoming happier and more content and deeply satisfied the more we come to know God. Our second question to consider this morning is, who is the one to be known? We've already seen that answer. It's God, the one who created us, the one who saved us, the one who loves us, the one who watches over us, the one who has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He is the God in whom we live and move and have our being. He knit us together in our mother's wombs. And he knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. Let's read verse 17 again, shall we? It says, May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Did you know that God actually designed human beings to know him? This is why we were made in the image of God himself. So that we can know God and be known by him in a relationship. 
Animals are not made in the image of God, so they cannot know God. Even the glorious angels are not created in the image of God, so they cannot know God in the same way that humans can. But God created us in his own image in order to be known by us. God wants to be known. But let's be careful. Let us not think for a moment that God was lonely or that he needs to be known. But rather, it is his good pleasure to be known in relationship. God is self-sufficient and has no need for anything or anyone outside of himself. For he is already perfectly known within himself in the love that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But in his free grace, God chose to allow that love and knowledge to overflow himself and include other beings in knowledge of him. And as human beings created in God's image, we have that awesome privilege of being able to know God. But humanity's fall into sin meant that this relational knowledge was darkened and warped and ruined as God banished us from the Garden of Eden and from his very presence. So sin means now that, that humans don't wish to know God. They want to be God. That is, we want to be our own gods. But Jesus Christ was the man who knew God perfectly. And through faith in him, in his death and resurrection, relationship with God is restored. And we can enter into true and intimate knowledge of God once again through Jesus Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. But you know, sin still lingers as a strong habit in our lives as it manifests itself as selfishness and self-centeredness and general pride in ourselves. And this sinful pride then dulls the desire to know God. And it hinders our growth in knowing God. But look at how the Apostle Paul describes this God whom he yearns and prays that we would know. He is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the Father of glory. And so here Paul is not talking about knowing a God, small g, some generic deity, or he's not talking about general knowledge of the divine here. He's talking about knowing the God, the only God, the true God, the living God, creator of all things. He is specifically the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is specifically the Father of glory. When it comes to knowing God, we don't want to know any other God than specifically the God of the Bible, the one true and living God. To try to know anyone else is just a waste of time. But the danger we must be aware of in seeking to know God is that we must avoid forming God in our own image. Because God is who he is, and through his word he reveals himself as he is not as we would necessarily like him to be or wish that he was. It can be very easy to begin to mold and to shape God into an image that is much more to our liking, much safer, much nicer, much more comfortable, much preferable. But then we're not really getting to know God as he is, not as he has revealed himself to be. If we truly want to know God, we must seek to know the true God. We must seek to know the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. And the only way to know the true God is to seek him in the truth of his revealed word. And this brings us to our third and final question for this morning. How is this amazing God known? We've already explored the crucial importance of knowing God. We must know God. That God is worthy to be known. That he desires to be known. That he created us and designed us to know him. And even that knowing God is actually our greatest happiness. Because that's what we were designed for. And we must seek to know God well. Not in a, a shallow or a surface level way, but deeply. We may have many friends in this life. On Facebook, we might have a very big number of friends. But one relationship is far more important than all the others. Our relationship with God. It is worth the most time, 
It is worth the most energy. It is worth, worth the, the most investment. If you ended your life with no friends whatsoever, zero friends on Facebook, if you ended your life with no friends whatsoever, except God, that would be a good life. That would actually be far better than having thousands of friends, but no knowledge of the living God. But we ask now, how is God known? Let's look at verse 17 again. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So first of all, we see that this deep knowledge of God is actually a gift from God himself. For that is what Paul is praying for, that God would give it. So God is the one to be known, and he is the one who graciously bestows and grants that knowledge. But we also see that this special knowledge from God comes from the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who gives wisdom to his people, and it is the Spirit who reveals God through his holy word. Without the Holy Spirit at work within us, we can make no progress in knowing God. He, he mentions the spirit of wisdom. Well, what is wisdom then? Well, wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord, what the Old Testament talks about. The fear of the Lord, which is the proper reverence we must have for the Holy God. This fearful wisdom is the foundation of knowing God. We cannot know God unless and until we begin to fear him. Revelation is that which is revealed, which implies that unless God chooses to unveil himself, he remains hidden and obscure to us. God transcends our understanding. To try to know God in your own power would be like trying to look into the sun. God is unknowable. and He's unknown unless he reveals himself. And praise his name, he has done just that. God has revealed himself, who he is, his character, his ways, his delights, and he has given this revelation through his word, the scriptures. It is the Holy Spirit who gives the wisdom of the fear of the Lord, and it is the Holy Spirit who reveals God through the Bible. It is also the Holy Spirit who, who opens the eyes of our hearts to understand the scriptures so that we can know God. But as God in his grace begins to provide this wisdom and revelation through the Holy Spirit and his holy word, how do we grow in knowing God? That's an important question. Well, let me give you, I think, two simple principles or two simple steps. The first step is beginning to learn more about God. That's how we begin to get to know anyone. When you make a new friend or you go on a first date, you begin to learn facts about the other person, who they are, where they're from, what they like, what they don't like. You gain a basic working knowledge of who that person is. And it's the same with God. We have to get to know about him by reading his word. And so we learn facts about him, who he is, what he does, how he acts, what he likes, what he doesn't like. The more we read God's word, the more we study the scriptures, the more we mine the depths of the Bible, the more we will begin to learn of God and who he is, the more we will begin to know him. But we cannot just stop with trivial knowledge about God. If we stop there, then he is just like an interest, interesting artifact in a museum but there's no personal connection or impact on our daily lives. No, we cannot stop there with just mere theological knowledge about God. We must press forward to then apply that knowledge in relationship with Him. We must also gain, this is the second step, we must also gain relational knowledge of God. What does it mean, relational knowledge? Well, this means walking with God talking with God, living in the presence of God, depending upon Him, tasting Him and seeing that He is indeed good, learning that He is faithful. So theolo theological knowledge about God must be put into practice in a real, living, relational walking alongside God. 
Consider Micah chapter 6, verse 8, which declares, God has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So we know that God is just and that God loves mercy. That's the theological knowledge about God. God is just, God loves mercy. Okay, we know that about him. But scripture then commands us in that verse to put this into action. Then to do justice ourselves, to love mercy ourselves, and to walk in a humble relationship with our God. This is what knowing God is. We have to know about him. And then at the same time, we apply that knowledge to our daily lives by walking with him. If I know many facts about God, but I'm not walking with God, then I don't really know him. And if I claim to be walking with God, but I really don't know much about who he is or how he wants me to live, I don't really know him either. To know God means having both of these things working together. And this is what we see at work in the lives of Moses and of David and, of course, especially the Lord Jesus. They knew about God and they walked with God. And this informed their worship of God. And so as we conclude this morning, if you don't take anything else home with you from this, from this sermon, I pray you remember this. I need to know God. Knowing God is the most important thing in my whole life. There is no higher goal or aspiration than to know the living God. I ought to thirst after knowing God the way a deer pants for streams of water. Knowing God is the meaning of life. Knowing God is the joy of the soul. Knowing God is the contentment of the restless heart. May each of our hearts begin to long after knowing God. May a real dissatisfaction of our, our level of present knowledge of Him arise in our hearts so that we would be motivated to press on to higher ground in knowing God, learning who He is, and walking beside Him daily in the right relationship that our Savior Jesus Christ has purchased for us. Let us pray together. Most holy God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, it is to you that we pray this morning. You are the one who has done so much for us. Not only have you created us, not only have you given us life, every beat of our heart and every breath of our lungs, but if we are believers in Jesus Christ, then you have given us redemption by his blood and you've given us an eternal inheritance that we can put our sure expectation of hope in. So you have done everything for us, Father. But Father, I pray that if, if there's anyone here this morning or even in my own heart, Father, if, I, if I'm realizing today that really you're much more of an acquaintance in my life, sort of on the level of a next door neighbor rather than a friend, let alone a best friend, then Father, may a holy and righteous dissatisfaction arise in my heart today to say, I must know the living God. Father, may that truly be the cry of our hearts that we want to know you more, to spend more time in your word, in your scriptures, so that we can know about you, who you are. But then also at the same time, applying that knowledge to a daily relational walking with you because we are so grateful that the Lord Jesus Christ has repaired and restored the damaged relationship that was sending us all to hell. And in Christ, by faith in the blood 
uh, that he shed upon the cross, we have restored in right standing with you now, Father. But so often we neglect that right relationship with you, Father. Because it's like we've got our ticket to heaven and that's good enough for us. Mm. And so the Bible sits on the shelf too long collecting dust. And our prayers are reduced to praying before meals. Mm. And Father, we're not making much effort to know the God who has done so much, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so Father, today, may our hearts yearn and long to know you. Father, if we must begin with a spirit of repentance, let it be so today, Father. To say, I have neglected my relationship with you, Father. Forgive me so that I can start fresh and anew to press on that upward way to know you. For Father, this is what the Holy Spirit impressed upon the Apostle Paul in that moment when he was writing these words. That above everything else, the prayer of our hearts and the cry of our hearts ought to be, I want to know the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, may that too be the cry of our hearts this day as we leave this place. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.